This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. For about two years, Malcolm Linton and I interviewed and photographed over 100 people who were either living with HIV or who were at high risk of becoming infected. One of the ways we met people was through Stephanie Strathdee and Tom Patterson and their collaborators who introduced us to people they were working with. Hola, I'm Stephanie. I moved from New York and I started working for Proyecto Cohete um, because um, that was a way of um, getting into the drug using community and making contact with a lot of the people I wanted to photograph. To begin with, I was taking blood from those people, doing blood tests. Um, and so they saw me as a nurse and I would tell them that I was a photographer, um, but they reacted to me differently as a result of thinking of me as somebody who was helping in a way care for them or was involved with their health rather than just taking pictures of them. One of the problems with magazine and newspaper journalism is it's static. You're there for the day or the week or the month even and you don't really see what happens to people and efforts to help people over time. And so that's really what I think attracted both of us was this notion that we were going to see the passage of time. For this kind of story it seemed to me that it was very important to be close to the people so that when things happened I could be right on top of it and I could circulate around the town every day maybe a couple of times looking for people to photograph and none of the photographs were set up so it was a matter of trying to catch people doing what they were doing and I had to be there for that. When we first went there we stayed on the upper part of the canal and it took quite a while before we even went down. I think Malcolm went down first. And people sell heroin in the canal. They openly shoot heroin in the canal. And they make little homes called yungos that are sticks with blankets and trash. And it's a mixture of a garbage dump, a sewer, and most profoundly, a community. And part of what we were after was showing the human side of these people who are you know, largely despised. And we wanted to show them living their lives in that community. The key to going down there to begin with was that I went with Susie. She lived there for, I think, eight years earlier in her life. So she knows everybody there. She's passionately dedicated to doing something for drug users and particularly people who are HIV positive, because she is. She would never stop anybody shooting up right beside her because that's not how she works. I mean, what she would do would be to talk to people um, on a continuing basis about the possibility of stopping using heroin. But she's conscious of the fact that she needs to preserve a relationship with them. And to nag people about stopping their habits is, is not going to help her do that. Uh, she has a son who's living with her now, and the son is recently married and has a child, so Susie is a grandmother. She always felt very guilty about him because he developed a heroin habit for a while. Um, but now he's clean, and the family appears to be doing well together, and Susie seems to be happy. Victor was uh, a guy we met in Las Memorias, which is the AIDS hospice on the edge of Tijuana. 
Las Memorias is somewhere between a traditional hospice where people who have end-stage disease die, but more than that, it's a hostel. Most everyone's infected with HIV. Some have families and they live there as husband, wife with children. There's a wing for um, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender um, people. And it's also a place to go for recovery if you have a substance problem. Victor, um, when we met him, was very sick because he hadn't got access to HIV drugs. And he didn't get access to them until almost three months after we met him. When he did eventually get his drugs, he made a very effective recovery. I guess Victor felt some sort of gratitude to Los Memorias because they had, in a sense, given him his life back. And he would spend his days sweeping the floors and so on throughout the place. Uh, I think he did that for two or three or four weeks before he finally left Memorias the second time. Fernanda is a transgender sex worker I met in the street in Tijuana, on the corner where the transgenders tend to work. Fernanda was great because I'd met huge resistance trying to photograph the transgenders. And she was one of the first people who accepted me and allowed me to photograph her. She liked to smoke crystal, spent a lot of her time high. She was extremely funny. After Fernanda discovered that she was HIV positive, she told me that it wasn't the fact of being positive that concerned her, but it was other people laughing at her. The word she used was burla, which means mockery. We don't pressure anybody to reveal their status, but we did ask Fernanda how we should deal with that in the book, and she thought about it for a while. And then she, she, she just looked up and she said, it's okay, you can, you can say that I'm positive, which I thought was a phenomenally brave thing on her part, given the reaction that she'd anticipated. It was very important to us that the people who participated in our project felt like participants. They understood what we were doing, they consented to us telling their stories and using their photographs, and we didn't want anyone to feel like they had to do it. No one had to participate. They wanted to tell their stories. Oscar was one of the people who somebody at Huete introduced me to. He says that he has, I think, three personalities in all. One is Oscar, who is a sort of retiring young guy. Then he has the personality of Beto, who is a male sex worker. And then he has the personality of his female equivalent, Alejandra, Beto is jealous of Alejandra because Alejandra makes more money than he does. And he says that Alejandra is, is in a sense, his boss. She tells him what to do. He says she's a terrible girl because she is inclined to do things that are risky. When we met Nellie, we met her at the Trans Memoranza event, which was right. an event held to commemorate all the trans people who had been killed in, in uh, Mexico. And she invited us to her house, and she lived in, in uh, a colonia near Las Memorias, the edge of town, with her mother. And it was her mother's house and two children. And it was you know, very poor. And when we went there, we found out that she was caring for another woman who had AIDS. And it was astonishing how generous she was. You know, she had very, very little. And she was taking what little she had and sharing it with someone else. And the other woman she went to, Brenda, is from San Diego and had been deported. And she was caring for Brenda because Brenda's family had rejected her, in part because she had become a lesbian and she had five children. And Nellie was helping her get medical care and trying to help her survive. Brenda tragically died of AIDS. So the first picture I showed of Sergio and his family in Memorias was actually just a, a snapshot at a party. It was one of those situations where people say, hey, take our picture, and you reluctantly do it, um, and then move on to what you were really interested in. 
what happened to them was that Sergio managed to get out of Memorias, I guess, on a, on a pass or something like that, um, and got arrested um, carrying crystal and wound up in jail. Sergio Araceli and their son Eduardo were all HIV positive. Araceli, his wife, within a few months died of AIDS. So their son Eduardo uh, wound up getting put in an orphanage. Uneme, the orphanage where Eduardo lives, and Las Memorias, the AIDS hospice, both provide excellent care. But in this day and age, why do we have orphanages and hospices for people with HIV? In the United States and Europe, they've shuttered their doors. And the fact that they exist in Tijuana today ultimately shows the shortcoming of the response.